was a that was a mental model for me that the novel did not have to proceed in a linear fashion using only narrative. Electronic literature for me is literature that takes advantage of the capacity of new media to Oh yeah, no, I don't remember it's, it's literature that engages its digitality. I remember sitting in my office when, when Jeff finished in his many times and thinking, oh my God, he's too stupid to read this thing. Prepared to for his non volume in the for glass the door, these certain messages, very clean as there is no seen variety, very, very clean small there bridge, is no pleasure, overly moist, prepared, sugar is not a volume, not having examined the room, grabbing at these rags, kindness, Related to the vulture, and shape, however, in varying sides and the door, for the sake, for the sake, journey, use, glass, they open, are double, for the sake, and rapid exploration requires most beauty classes, while the body, by the crowd, justified by appeal. Electronic literature is two words that go together, resonate together. Uh, I, I suppose I would say it is, it can be considered practice involving text that resonates with considerations of media, resonates with uh, problems of media or platforms of media, taking advantage of platforms of media, as Amrit said, or for me, resonating with conceptual issues involving mediation and digitization of information. So the first screen you see is this big image made in Mac Paint, if anyone knows what that is. It's just like a splash page, an image of the patchwork girl herself. Click through it to what is essentially a title page, Patchwork Girl or a Modern Monster by Mary slash Shelley and herself. And from here, you have links to five different sections of the text, the graveyard, the journal, the quilt, the story, and something called broken accents. I think electronic literature is literature which requires a device to be read, and the device has to be electronic. And I work with artist books. Um, I was influenced by the works that I saw in camera works, um, by um, works in San Jose, which is um, by the art space of San Jose State that Stephen Muir Moore curated. So I was in a field that was halfway between visual arts and halfway between writing. And of course performance art also that I was associated with and the artist books. So those were uh, interests that I continued with. Electronic literature is machine enabled stories, poems, images uh, that are not available only as traditional print or uh, sculptural uh, events. They're mediated by machines and they don't exist in, in a, a format that the other arts have traditionally taken. Boxes, raising the dirt, only several colors, haul the one cluster away, variety each emetted, package of seeds, the several knotted rows. Location tip of hand, magnify the bottom darting in their habitual shadows, seen bending. We're all moving toward storytelling in digital space, and some of the most interesting experiments that are happening are in um, electronic literature. You're coming out of a, a Dadaist tradition uh, of saying there is there's something beyond this, and, and I'm, I'm going to rearrange this stuff and, and find other layers beyond the visible or make other ways. I think electronic literature is digital-born literature that would not exist otherwise than by mediation through a computer. Electronic literature is the exploration of how we can tell stories with the augmentation uh, of technology, so what technology makes possible in our storytelling palette, and particularly thinking about kind of the networked and connective tissues of literature and storytelling and the ways that we realize those through the technologies we already use all the time, particularly on the web. The lack of clear signal arrangements and attempts to vex you, and rather an invitation to read either inquisitively or playfully, 
playful and also a threat. This time of year, kids are interested and invite you. Electronic literature can be a number of things. It, it's interactive. It has to do with words and images. I go in and out of what to call myself. I still say different things. But within the community, I create electronic literature, yeah. which, which I would call poetic narrative. So I'm a poet who works with narrative. I, I think the day that comes that we don't actually to distinguish it as electronic literature is the day that, that uh, we finally, uh, well, I, would be the day that, well, we don't have to ask questions like that again. Ah, uh, an otherworldly glass of beer. A pink uh, glass. But wouldn't you like an otherworldly uh, glass of beer? But wouldn't you like an otherworldly glass of beer? Of bushes, just beside the trail as you crest the hill, amber-colored beer in a tall crystal glass, quite, quite fallen on the other side. The smell of hops and honey, a golden icebox. Ah, uh, but wouldn't you like an otherworldly glass of beer? The sound of White capped mountains, amber colored, the sound of a tall crystal, white glass. capped mountains, cold water, amber colored, beer white in a tall running down glass. the sides, cold water, Walking down to the water, the smell of hops and honey, the daily in and out flow of the bin bites, the daily the smell in and out green flow of the bin bites, the the stone the smell the river of the green grass. Correct. It is word, image, sound, moving image, touch, bits, mind, body, heart. To be linked to the chain of existence and events, yes, but bound by it, no. I forge my own links. I'm building my own monstrous chain. And as time goes on, perhaps it will begin to resemble, rather, a web. Primarily artistic work that has a strong emphasis in the literary, but cannot be divorced from its medium, which is digital, and so uh, you can't print it, it's not like an ebook. One of the challenges I had set for me for this text was to try to write a novel that no 20th century writer could write. And the only way to do that is obviously to try to push the text itself beyond what it's possible. To possible to do. So including projective at things like the oracle, including a borrower that literally takes the text and reconfigures it in ways that cannot be predicted. And that, I think, is you know, what Burroughs is getting at. It's that um, the, the, the text itself can be exploded and that when you take those pieces and reassemble them, something new can come out that you did not even put there, that you did not know was there. Um, and that is what makes it, a, a, that pushes it beyond what you can, you as a writer can possibly do. I guess I would say that electronic literature is reading, um, and it could be it could be symbols, it could be icons, um, through some sort of electronic means. It could be digital. It could be analog electricity. And so something I would say interactive would be maybe a, a key word, but not necessarily um, kinetic. Perhaps a couple of things, but I feel like it's such a broad thing. It's hard to just define. I think you you just gotta be be open. To what's out there. Hypertext, to put it clearly, is a mapping of a text onto a four dimensional space. Normal grammars then do not apply and become branching structures anew. Fragments, branches, links. The word is glowing and on a screen. It is electronic and cannot be touched. It has been copied over thousands of times and reverberates through virtual space. The text coils in on itself. It is a topographic map of the air currents in the upper atmosphere, those sudden winds that change direction, inexplicable. The reader becomes a sort of satellite taking photographs of a huge and varied terrain. The reader can see the whole world or zoom in to see a particular ant on the banks of the sun. The ant has six legs. The reader is staring at a video screen. 
How then to turn the page? To me, electronic literature is any kind of uh, literary practice that does not depend on the printed page, but may include the printed page. Remember, I have to remember, you have to remember to give me that, that um, I wrote this entire text in the machine, and so I was always the first reader, and I was discovering the ways in which I was in there. There was never a flow chart, there was never any, any, any set of texts to say, say the way through, so I was pursuing kinds of texture too. There are a lot of electronic literature classes, but how many are actually teaching students the range of what they can do in the field? How many new student writers are we producing? We are producing some, but not enough. It was one of my central theses in Patchwork Girl that there is no central thesis, <laughs> that there is no center, that there is no self, there is only a temporary and contingent coming, contingent coming together of influences and borrowed pieces that could as easily have come together in another form mm -hmm. and will come together in another form. That the desire to make oneself coherent and permanent is a doomed one but not only doomed, also an unhealthy one, that part of our job is to learn to let go <laughs> of ourselves. And literature is one of the ways we learn to let go of ourselves, let, learn to release ourselves into the stream of other people's thoughts and visions and to enjoy that alienation from our own monotonous dream of consciousness. And I think literature is this, the use of language to sort of disrupt the, its in, instrumental applications, right? So um, the question of electronic literature then is how, do, how are people working in the uh, digital vernacular or the emerging sort of media landscape to um, <laughs> estrange people from the, the conventional codes that, that try to organize human behavior and to create an occasion for something uh, otherwise. We look now at how simple it is to create immersive, full-res images, and we just did not have that technology. So I am, I am very happy with the narrative premise and I'm very happy with the way I executed, given the constraints. But I, I would really wish I could fix some of those pictures. Electronic literature is anything that you can't do in a linear print. And electronic is the wrong word here. It's anything that stretches text beyond. We are composing a culture with one work upon another. The Pathfinders Project is a preservation project that aims to make electronic literature available for generations beyond us. This project is very important because if you think about it, early digital literature represents a cultural moment and a historical change in the way we think about literature. In Pathfinders, we used a concept called traversal, a way of capturing author and user interactions on the work's original platform. I wanted the reader to feel that there were distinctly different human stories. This is fundamentally embodied. Somebody told me it was their bedtime story every day, and uh, it was a lot of fun to do, and I also found telling the story that way appealed to the social media nature of, of the audience. We think this method of preservation in conjunction with things like migration and emulation will keep crucial works alive so that future readers can better understand them. Without a doubt, we have the potential to transform the field of digital media preservation. This multimedia book is just the beginning.
Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for a live, spe uh, special live stream traversal broadcast from the Electronic Literature Lab at Washington State University. Today we are performing Red Planet, Scientific and Cultural Encounters with Mars, created by Robert Markley, Harrison Higgs, Michelle Kendrick, and Helen Burgess. I am Deanie Grigard, the Director of the Lab and Professor in the Creative Media and Digital Culture Program here at the University. This event is part of the Born Digital Media Preservation Series celebrating the Electronic Literature Organization's move from MIT to WSUV. It's sponsored by this university as well as WSU's Lewis E. and Stella G. Buchanan's Distinguished Professorship and the Electronic Literature Organization. If this is your first time that you've joined us, you're probably wondering what is meant by a traversal. This is a process that was developed for the Pathfinders Project by Stuart Molthrop and me, and is defined as audio and video recording of a demonstration performed on a historically appropriate platform by an author or reader of a work. Think of it as a formal game through for a playthrough for a game. This means that we're presenting Red Planet with the original copy of the DVD on the hardware and software the work would have been experienced on about the time it was released in 2001. So this means it's running on an iMac G3 that we affectionately refer to as the Lampshade Mac, Lampshade Mac running on the Apple Classic Operating System 8.6. So you'll notice some quirks which we embrace fully and the most important one is that the interface appears small on the monitor because of the ratio difference between this computer and the original. We're live streaming this traversal as well as capturing the social media contact generated during the event. You're welcome to post comments and questions on Facebook and Twitter and the, and the t YouTube live chat and we'll respond to you during the event and or during the Q&A that follows. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues in L. This begins with Nicholas Schiller who is the Associate Director as well as Greg Philbrook, the Instructional and Technology Support Specialist. Also with us today are three of the four undergraduate researchers. I'm Veronica Whitney, who's the Electronic Literature or, uh, Lab's Catalog Content Specialist, Mariah Gwynn, who's the Games Research Assistant, and Katie Bowen, who's the Document Specialist. We also want to thank Helen Burgess. She's faculty from NC State who served on this faculty at, in uh, the DTC program then in 2003 to 6. She flew in to Vancouver specifically to perform her work. Besides Red Planet, she also produced Biofutures, Owning Bi Body Parts and Information and Highways of the Mind, an interactive book um, for iPad and from Penn Press, co-authored with Jean Hemming. Her latest work is the Routledge Research Companion to Digital, Media, Digital Medieval Literature 2018, co-edited with Jen Boyle. She's currently preparing a digital humanities project called Intimate Fields for publication in the University of Victoria's Kits for Culture series with fellow NCSU member Margaret Simon. The link to this live stream traversal will be archived at the L website, which we will post on Facebook and Twitter for you. Our Facebook channel and Twitter hashtag are both ELIT Pathfinders. Helen will perform her work for approximately around 30 minutes and then will follow her performance with a Q&A. You can post your questions via any of these three social media networks and we'll answer them. So let's get started. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. How's that? Good? Okay. This is Red Planet. Red Planet. Um, it comes in a, a DVD-ROM box. Um, it came out in 2001. We started working on it in 1997, so it was a four-year project. I'm going to pop the box open. Boop! We have a DVD-ROM. I'm going to pop it out. Put it into the lampshade. And we'll get started. All right. And it takes a little time to uh, to spin up the drive, so let me just tell you a little bit about the project. This project is uh, by Robert Markley, uh, who was my dissertation director when I started as a graduate student at West Virginia University in 1997. Um, Harrison Higgs and Michelle Kendrick, who were both faculty at uh, Washington State Vancouver, and I was uh, a kind of a grad student researcher on the project. Um, other people. 
on the project uh, were some of my fellow graduate students, Catherine Gouge, who did uh, early video interviews, um, Jeannie Hamming and Dan Tripp, who did uh, web work and research, um, and the chief designer, the lead artist was Jeanette O'Kinzik, who also worked at Washington State University. And so let's see if we can get this thing to launch. Um, one of the things you should know about this project is that it's running on a, a legacy system, um, OS, Mac OS 9 point something, 9.3. Um, this project came out right before Mac transitioned to uh, the OS 10 system. Um, so for a while Mac was running two operating systems at the same time. You'd have uh, Mac OS 9 running as what they called a classic uh, in the background. Excellent, scary sounding sound. Alright, so we have an opening screen here, um, and we have 11 chapters in the sequence um, after the interview. You can see a little table of contents pops up as we roll over each one. Um, the project is, is divided into several kind of thematic chunks. Um, one is a kind of an early history of Mars, how we imagined Mars to be in the past. Um, so it, it deals with um, issues such as um, uh, early views of Mars through uh, telescopes, what it looked like uh, to people like Percival Lowell, who imagined he saw canals on Mars, for example. Um, then we moved through to a few chapters that are primarily concerned with Mars in science fiction. And that is partly because um, we inherited this project from a researcher at Georgia Tech, Ann Balsamo, who was working on a, a CD-ROM about Mars in science fiction, and um, we took this project and kind of ran with it. So we have a science fiction section, and then we moved on to um, a few chapters that were really ultimately about climate, um, about um, planetology and climatology on Mars. And um, one of the really motivating um, uh, messages of this DVD-ROM was about how Mars really reflects back to us what we think about uh, climate and planetology on the planet Earth. Uh, when we think about terraforming, we're really thinking about terraforming our own planet as well as another planet. Um, yeah, and then we have a big chunk of video interviews at the end, and I can tell you um, we had many interviewees. Uh, we had 60 video interviews, which was quite exceptional at the time. There was just not a lot of space for um, video on digital work. So we have um, several researchers from NASA Ames. We have researchers from Tulane University, Stanford University, University of Toledo, Duke University, uh, the Lowell Observatory. We have a couple of science fiction authors, including Tim Stanley Robinson. And we have uh, Robert Zubrin, uh, president of the Mars Society. So what I'm going to do is run through um, a couple of the chapters in the time that we have. And um, I'll start with um, the introductory piece, which really gives you a, an overview of what the project was about. Um, one thing I'll tell you is that uh, we have, if we used a person who did a voiceover for the project and this project was kind of imagined like a book, almost like a talking book with video in it. Um, so I'll let his voice run through the first chapter for you, and then I'll 
interrupt as, as I see fit. Okay, so here goes, we're clicking on the introduction. Ah, Lars has exerted a great pull on our imagination uh, from the time of, of Percival Lowell seeing canals and Schiaparelli, uh, others before. Uh, Orson Welles, H.G. Wells, many of the Wells have had a lot to do with this. Uh, why Mars? Mars has features on its surface. It's one of our, uh, it's a neighboring planet with features uh, that make us believe that we see seasons. And indeed, there are seasons. Humanity, in order to be the humanity I want to be in, has to be a multi, has to be willing to get off their butt and get off their planet. Um, has to be able to move off the, you know, Earth or ethnocentric one planet uh, civilization into the galaxy. It has to become a Star Trek civilization. And that's the civilization I want to be in. The fact of the matter is, is that we are much better prepared today to send people to Mars than we were to send people to the moon in 1961 when John F. Kennedy started the moon program. For over 100 years, Mars has fascinated novelists, readers, moviegoers, and scientists. Martians have invaded the Earth in hundreds of science fiction novels and films. Thousands of scientific studies, beginning with Percival Lowell's books at the turn of the century, have sought to explain the planet's geography and climate. They have tried to imagine what life would be like on the Red Planet for indigenous species or future generations of human beings. Red Planet, Scientific and Cultural Encounters with Mars, offers an in-depth, cross-disciplinary exploration of the significant roles that Mars has played in 19th and 20th century astronomy, literature, and speculative thought. During this multimedia title, you will listen to prominent scientists, novelists, and visionaries. You will get a sense of the wide range of responses by leading experts to the prospect of human missions to Mars early in the 21st century. Mars, you will discover, is not only an object of scientific study, but a screen on which humankind projects its hopes for the future of civilization and its fears of ecological devastation on Earth. So as you'll notice, this, um, this project reads through quite, quite like a book in chapters. And so we have a, a kind of a forward and back button. We have a mute button. We have a kind of an up to the main um, uh, area of the, the table of contents. So it's, it's quite a, a linear um, project in comparison to some of the more electronic literature um, traversals you might have seen in the past that are really much more hypertextual. For many geologists and exobiologists, Mars is the cornerstone of the emerging discipline of comparative planetology, the study of Earth in relation to other planets. For science fiction novelists since the days of H.G. Wells, Mars has served as a thought experiment, a way to reimagine human identity and nature itself in an alien environment. And for some people, Mars represents humanity's next step towards its manifest destiny as a spacefaring civilization. Yeah, well now the reason to go to Mars, I think, is to do comparative planetology. There, there's, a, a, there's a stepwise order of reasons to go to Mars. And the first reason is to go there to learn more about Mars because that will teach us more about Earth. And we need to know everything that we possibly can know about Earth to get through what I think of as a kind of crisis period, a couple centuries of overcrowded environmental danger. Mars gives us the opportunity to redefine our understanding of ecology and to see our Earth-bound views made strange by their transportation to an alien world. Some questions have been with us for over a century and will guide our exploration for centuries more. Was there or is there life on Mars? What does the geophysical history of Mars tell us about our own planet? Can we, by terraforming the planet, create a livable environment for future generations of human beings? All right, so that was kind of a, an introduction to the project. And um, from there, we move through um, the different sections uh, that talk about um, early history. One of the um, wonderful things about working on this project as a grad student was that I got to travel with um, Bob Markley to the Lowell Observatory in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona and look at um, Percival Lowell's papers and drawings and globes that he built. Um, he was an avid observer of the planet Mars and he built all these little globes that showed um, that there were canals on Mars that he'd 
observed in his um, uh, with using his beautiful telescope that was built in 1910. Um, so I'll just I'll show you some of these images, but I'll I'll turn off the the speaker so that we're not here all day. During the opposition of 1877-78, the Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli. All right. So um, one of the features, the, the features of each subsection is that we have little little chunks that pop out from the chapters, and there are four uh, key terms, uh, biographies, that kind of thing. So we have a hyperlink for Giovanni Schiaparelli, for example. So we get a little bio of uh, Schiaparelli. And we have some images, and then we pop back to the main narrative. Right. Although Schiaparelli was noted as a skilled planetary observer, many of his contemporaries reserved judgment about the straight lines he had drawn on the Martian surface. In his comprehensive history of the planet Mars, 1892, the French astronomer Camille Flammarion surveyed all the published observations of the planet since the 17th century and reproduced many of his predecessor's sketches. Flammarion felt uneasy about the question of the canals. He conceded that Schiaparelli had seen something, but was hesitant to accept his colleague's complex, geometrically precise system of waterways as a demonstrated fact. I think one of the things that strikes me about this section is um, we were really looking at this idea of um, humans wanting desperately to believe that there was life out there and specifically life on Mars and they really did believe that um, that you could see seasons on Mars and Mars does have seasons it has uh, dust storms that um, move through um, according to planetary cycles but um, people like uh, Lowell and Schiaparelli believed that what they were seeing with the dust storms were actually blooms of um, vegetation hmm. happening on Mars. So there was life there, there were forests, everything <laughs> was happening, which I just think is kind of amazing. And um, so we have these uh, beautiful diagrams. Um, so Percival Lowell went to uh, Flagstaff, Arizona in 1894. He set up an entire observatory. He was incredibly rich. And so you could do that kind of thing. So he, he built a, a few telescopes up there and he started uh, looking up there and drawing images of what he saw. Um, it was really interesting to be up there um, in the late 90s and look through the same telescope that he used when he was doing these observations. And to just see, it's almost like looking at the sky and having the sky be underwater. It's very kind of swimmy looking in the upper atmosphere. And then just occasionally the planet would just pop into focus and you could see these kind of dark patches on it. Um, and those dark patches are, are what Lowell drew and imagined to be vegetation. So he did this, these observations during uh, between 1894 and 1916 and he was really quite convinced that um, there was life up there. Right. And so here we can see um, some of his beautiful maps and diagrams. Lowell's description of a Martian climate with deserts, oases, and canals marks an early step in the sciences of comparative planetology. However fanciful his conclusions may seem a century later, they were part of a coherent and influential theory of the solar system. Taking his cue from the rhetoric of Darwinian evolution, Lowell argued that all planets, including Earth, eventually decline as a result of inevitable processes. Over eons, planets lose their water and atmosphere to the vacuum of space and decline to a desiccated old age. Um, one of the other interesting things about being in Arizona to see this was that you could go outside and you know go for a drive half an hour in any direction and you'd be in the desert and it's red and it just looks like Mars so uh, there was this kind of interesting um, fit between Lowell's imagination of 
maybe a planet that was slowly losing its, its water um, with deserts and the desert that uh, the observatory was located in Okay, he wrote a bunch of books about this, as one should. And we have uh, photographic plates from the observatory. As you can see, they uh, uh, were mapped against um, diagrams claiming to prove that there were canals on Mars. There's the observatory. All right, we'll pop out of that for, for a second. Alright, so from, from these early view chapters we move into um, uh, the kind of science fiction-y section of the project um, and so we start out with War of the Worlds and H.G. Wells um, and uh, some radio broadcasts and then we move into um, kind of a, a section on utopians on Mars. Um, there's a lot of uh, Russian literature about um, uh, Mars, colonizing mm. Mars, uh, aliens on Mars, pulp fiction, all that kind of good stuff. So um, we'll, we'll roll through one of the chapters here, see what that looks like. Mars has played a unique role in science fiction since the late 19th century. War of the Worlds may be the best known novel about invading Martians, but other writers, from the German philosopher Kurt Laswitz in 1897, to Edgar Rice Burroughs, who wrote 11 Mars novels between 1913 and 1944, to Kim Stanley Robinson in the 1990s, have used the Red Planet as a way to explore the political, economic, and ecological implications of social change. In important ways, Lowell's vision of a dying planet has shaped what writers could imagine and what their readers expect about a fictional Mars. On the Red Planet, humans confront the consequences of ecological devastation, sparse resources, vast stretches of desert, and thin or unbreathable air. Removed from epic tales of time travel and interstellar adventure, science fiction on Mars depicts the planet as both a setting for adventures and an implacable adversary. For many writers, Mars became a special case within the traditions of science fiction. It was not a hypothetical world in the far reaches of a distant galaxy, but with the exception of Venus, our closest planetary neighbor. And unlike cloud-shrouded Venus, Mars was visually accessible. By reading evolutionary laws into the natural history of the solar system, astronomers and science fiction writers followed Lowell in seeing Mars as an older, decrepit version of Earth. In contrast, Venus was supposedly at an earlier, more primitive stage in its evolution. Venus was our past, Mars our more fascinating future. For novelists from Lee Brackett to Philip K. Dick, even primitive Martians were the descendants of a master race of canal builders. On Mars, readers confronted a dying planet and an enervated civilization, the dark underside of our faith in scientific progress. After Schiaparelli's announcement, fiction writers seized on the Red Planet as a site for utopian speculation and an exotic setting for adventure. In 1880, Percy Gregg's Across the Zodiac became the first modern novel to send a man to a Mars inhabited by a technologically advanced civilization. His Martians live in a technotopia where manual labor is performed by semi-intelligent animals and electricity provides everything from telegraphic services to transportation. His human narrator learns, however, that progress has a price. The Martians are materialists and corrupt, and Gregg celebrates the spiritual values of a small religious sect and the soldierly honor of his hero. Perhaps in response to Gregg's conservative morality tale, the American novelists Alice Ingerfritz Jones and Ella Merchant made Mars the setting for their feminist utopia, a parallel unveiled in 1893. By 1905, Edwin Arnold in Lieutenant Gulliver Jones could cash in on Mars mania simply by whisking his hero to the Red Planet on a magic carpet, then strutting him through adventures on a very Earth-like planet. But as H.G. Wells had demonstrated, Science fiction could also serve as an important vehicle for social and political criticism, philosophical inquiry, and literary experimentation. Lowell's emphasis on the organizational complexity of his planet-wide system of canals inspired Kurd Lazvitz in On Two Planets, 1897, and the Russian physician and revolutionary agitator Alexander Bogdanov in Red Star, 1908, to depict Mars as the home of advanced civilizations that had conquered both social problems and a hostile Martian nature. 
floral idea that, um, that Mars is inhabited by this noble, um, uh, technologically advanced uh, race uh, staving off ecological disaster um, uh, was you know, ripe for all sorts of great uh, uh, romantic fiction. Edgar Rice Burroughs being a good example. Um, uh, and of course, we right away started projecting all sorts of uh, hopes and fears of our species on the uh, putative Martians with four of the world on the other side of that coin. Uh, but even after uh, um, uh, Lowell's death and the idea that Mars was inhabited by this super race uh, was largely dissipated at least in the scientific community, um, uh, the idea of Mars as an intriguing place to visit in its own right uh, continued to find champions in the science fiction uh, field. Um, uh, Arthur Clarke wrote in fact, his very first full-length novel entitled Sands of Mars, uh, I think it was published in 1951. Um, it was a, a, a very serious, it was one of the very first serious attempts to describe a more or less modern Mars and how you would really get there with real technology and what Mars' real physical environment was like until an interesting adventure takes place within this environment. And I think that was the harbinger of a whole series of, of novels in which the, the, the um, Blue, green, red Mars uh, trilogy um, uh, is a direct linear descendant of that. You see people really going to going to a real Mars, real as scientists allow us to understand it at any given moment, and and on this real environment, uh, action, adventures, and romance take place. In different ways, both Lasbitz and Bogdanov envisioned the contact between Martians and Earthlings as a way to dramatize the shortcomings of European society at the turn of the century. Both novelists had their heroes fall in love with beautiful Martian women as a way of exploring the psychological and emotional significance of European encounters with superior societies. And both utopian novels proved influential. Bogdanov's socialist technotopia became a staple of early Soviet science fiction after the Russian Revolution of 1917, although its author had been attacked by Lenin. In the Soviet Union, Red Star was replaced in public consciousness by Alexei Tolstoy's wildly popular Aelita, 1922. The novel makes little effort at scientific plausibility. The hero, Engineer Loss, builds a spacecraft in a garage, and he and his compatriot, Gusev, journey to Mars in less than a day. There they discover the contrasts of Lowell's dying planet, both the dead landscape of a destroyed planet and civilized regions intersected by full canals covered with orange groves of vegetation and canary meadows. Do so I'll pop through here and uh, just point out that we were fortunate to get access to a few um, early films that we were able to clear rights to add to the DVD-ROM and one of these is um, uh, 1924's Elita, um, which has a, a beautiful kind of melodramatic piano um, soundtrack. So we put in several clips here that you can kind of click through. Um, this is one of my favorites. Earth Man Meets Mars Woman. Mars could be so sexy. <laughs> All right. Can we move on to a discussion of Edgar Rice Burroughs? Uh, novels. If you saw John Carter in the last, the last decade, you'll know these stories. So I want to roll through here a little bit. So we have some descriptions of John Carter, more John Carter, um, and we talk about Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, Philip K. Dick. Um, this came to mind last week when Falcon Heavy uh, went into space rather spectacularly and launched the uh, the cherry red Tesla with a, uh, a, a little tiny rocket, rocket man in there and uh, a thumb drive containing a copy of Asimov's foundation, I think it was, into space. So um, even if no one else is thinking about Mars anymore, uh, Elon Musk clearly is. So go Elon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, what else have we got here? Okay. 
more science fiction. There's a lot of science fiction here. I want to rush through some of this just because we don't have a lot of time to go through it. Um, Robert Heinlein, Stranger in a Strange Land, Love the World. Okay, this is another film that um, we got the rights to uh, reproduce clips from. This is 1950s Rocket Ship XM, um, which is um, a lot of dudes kind of tramping across uh, Mars and having an adventure here. It's very red. Let's have a look. And I love the theremin music too. sure we can find our way back. I think there's some screaming here too, which is always good. too tense for me. <laughs> Let's keep going. Um, what the, the message here in this section is it's really that um, Mars has always been about our future and um, when we look at narratives about Mars we're really um, imagining how we want our future to be or uh, imagining how we fear our future to be and this is how it's kind of come to populate science fiction. Okay, back this case back. All right. And here, here we have um, what one of the features of the DVD-ROM is that we pepper it with interviews um, from different um, scholars. And so here we have Catherine Hales, who's do, uh, putting on her uh, science fiction criticism hat as a um, uh, an interviewer, interviewee. Well, in his correspondence, Dick mentions that um, he spent an extraordinarily long time writing Martian time slip, that is, long time by Philip K. Dick standards. He labored over that book for a couple of years, and then after he finished it, he wasn't able to market it successfully for quite a while. And I think it served as a kind of unfortunate object lesson to him that you should not spend too much time with your writing. And uh, in my view, Martian Time Slip is not only one of the most interesting of his books, but I think perhaps the best written of his books. And you can really tell that he took some time with the language of that book. But the conclusion that he drew from it was you couldn't make a living and spend that kind of time writing books. So in this weird way, I think Martian Time Slip was a kind of pivotal point in his career. And then shortly after that, he began turning books out at a truly amazing rate. I think in 1964 alone he wrote something like 11 novels. So um, he, he took the lesson that uh, if you want to eat, you better write fast. <laughs> and uh, after that, his books, although still fascinating and extremely interesting, don't have the same quality as literary language that I think is the case in Martian Time Slip. So one of the things I think makes the project um, really beautiful 
um, aside from the, the just expert design work of, of Harrison and Jeanette, is that um, NASA has taken these fantastic um, photographs right right throughout all its missions. And um, so one of the, um, the sections that we put in is really dedicated to these um, incredible um, images that we've had uh, from Mars over the decades and they, they really are gorgeous um, and I, I, I really think that, that one of the features of this project is the beautiful graphic design and the kind of the natural um, beauty of the, the Martian images really fed into the overall design of this work. You can see um, images from all the previous Mariner missions. Um, they really are very, very beautiful. Um, and you get this kind of um, marquee, just, just red, that pervades the project. rich and beautiful. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. Another feature of the project is that we try to explain some um, scientific uh, principles wherever we could. So we do something like showing how the session works. Permafrost. There's all these um, all these terms that you don't really come to know until you're interested in Mars. Things like regolith, which is what we call... Almost coincidental with... Uh, what we call Earth on Earth, but it's not Earth. So what do you call it? <laughs> we call it regolith, right? It's dirt. <laughs> Um, so, so the, the, the really big feature of this project was uh, the number of video interviews we did. Um, this was something you could not do on a CD-ROM at the time, and um, it's, it's, it was definitely uh, both technically unfeasible and incredibly expensive to do it for the web. And so uh, DVD-ROM fit in that, that pocket of the period as, as being the place where you could actually deliver a, a reasonable amount of um, video. So we conducted a lot of video interviews um, with people and um, we kind of, we set up this chapter of video interviews dialogically where we'd have um, a single question and we'd ask um, a, a range of people to give an answer and, and they would kind of, by laying them out in the screen next to each other, it's almost like they were talking to each other even though they weren't in the same rooms. So we could kind of click through and see, you know, an answer to, so this question, given the pressing social economic concerns here on Earth, why should we spend the money to go to Mars? And we can hear from Carol Stoker at NASA Ames. The, the reason I have, my personal reason, is that I think it's the future. I think humanity, in order to be the humanity I want to be in, has to be a multi, has to be willing to get off their butt and get off their planet. Um, has to be able to move off the, you know, Earth or ethnocentric one planet uh, civilization into the galaxy. It has to become a Star Trek civilization. And that's the civilization I want to be in. And so... Me too, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> um, or you can also hear from uh, Robert Zubrin, who's the president of the Mars Society, who's... Um, been uh, lobbying for a long time to get um, missions to Mars. What will the challenge of a Martian frontier do for us? Well, we'll start feeling the value of that challenge in terms of invigorating our society even before we get there, even when the program is first declared. Okay, where, where will we get a value? We'll find it in the youth, because youth loves adventure. And a Humans to Mars program would be an invitation to adventure to every kid in the country, learn your science and you can become part of pioneering a new world. Okay, and this will, you know, this is an invitation that many will find hard to refuse and will accept. 
Uh, and, you know, we have 50 million kids in the U.S. right now. We'll have another 50 million over the next 10 years. That's 100 million. If a human samaj program inspired even 1% more of them than otherwise would have been the case to become uh, scientists or engineers or whatever, that's a million extra scientifically educated minds making inventions, finding new medical cures. This is how we advance the human condition. And then once we get to Mars, there'll be nothing rarer or in shorter supply on a Mars base or a Mars settlement than human labor time. So what do we have? We'll have a technologically adept population in a frontier environment where they're forced to innovate and where they're not going to be held back from innovating by any existing institution. They will have need for hyperproductive crops for their greenhouses and they will be forced to do it and they will not let anybody who can spin out a lawsuit, you know, worrying about killer tomatoes, stop them from, from doing it. <laughs> I think I prefer Stoker's answer just because, you know, Star Trek universe, but yeah. <laughs> All right. So we, we have um, a whole sequence of, um, you know, 60 plus uh, videos of just people talking through what it means to go to Mars. How can we do it? Um, is there life on Mars? Um, uh, it's interesting to watch how this video has aged. We didn't know how much water was on Mars at the time, so uh, now we know there's a lot more than we thought there actually was when this thing was done. So um, you can get some interesting kinds of responses that are based on science that's you know, come a, a, a little way further since then. I would say that the most optimistic interpretation of life on Mars is that early in its history it had water and it had life. Then the question is, could that life have survived to the present? There's two ways in which life could still be alive on Mars, a leftover from this early period. One is deep underground and little hot spring, volcanic driven hot water aquifers surviving in isolation. And the other is frozen in the permafrost, dormant, still alive, but, but dormant. Unfortunately, when I look at both of these reservoirs, potential reservoirs, the refugia for life, critically, I'm forced to conclude that they're unlikely. I right, so. No life on Mars so far, but we'll see what happens. Right. So I'm just going to pop out of here. What does it mean, Doctor? It means there are times when a mere scientist has gone as far as he can. We must pause and observe respectfully while something infinitely greater assumes control. I believe this is one of those times. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I believe this is one of those times. And uh, we should continue to explore Mars. Um, and I think we're we're at time. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So um, thank you very much, uh, Dini and, and Greg. Thank you. I, I kind of wish I could run through the entire. about the interface, about the work, anything you want to ask. Will this ever be converted into an online platform? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think we'd have to go back through and capture the entire thing, um, maybe do the screen capture um, to, to run it like that. We, ha we still have all the, um, the videos. So this was done in um, uh, Macromedia Director before it became Adobe before it became extinct. And um, <laughs> one of the good things about it is that um, although the director files are binaries and, and so they, they can't really be played outside the player, at the very least all the video is uh, like external, what they call cast members, so they're linked to rather than being inside the binary. And so we still have all the video, which is good. So we could reproduce some of that work. And I think we could probably just do you know, little like screen snaps of every screen and, and put them online and do it. Um, the question is who's going to do it? 
right? Or and where do you get the rights? Because and where do you get the rights? Yeah, yeah. Because he doesn't own the book. Yeah. So it, you know, we could possibly get the rights back from him, and then the question is, could we still have the rights to uh, rocket ships with him and Alita? And the other one that I didn't show on here was Devil Girls from Mars. Um, we <laughs> we paid for permission, um, but you know. This was at a time before streaming, right? So nobody was expecting to make any money off this stuff. And so I kind of wonder whether we could get the rights to the streaming video, to like the, the fiction of it in there and the images. It's, that's a good question that I don't have the answer to. It's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. It's a challenge yeah, itself. it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, you had a question. Yeah. Um, we were, the chat was talking about Pride and Fiction and other fiction that has come out since this mm. about Mars. Mm. Is there anything that you would add off the top of your head? Uh, well, I think everything Kim Stanley Robinson has done since uh, is really exploring that same idea. Is that idea of um, really when we go out into space, what we're doing is exploring ourselves. Um, and you know where we want to be. I saw that really strongly with um, was it Aurora that came out a couple years ago, where you know it's very much like his his Mars book. Um, it's really about going out, being out in the universe, and then realizing that where you really want to be is home, right? And um, the the closing sequence in that book is. Um, this you know lifelong spacefarer who comes back to Earth and goes for a swim at the beach, and it's this really moving sequence uh, that goes over pages and pages of just swimming, um, and it reminded me very much of um, I think it's the end of Blue Mars where um, the the two main characters Anne and Jack are like eating ice cream on the shore in a future Mars that's been terraformed. Um, so yeah, I think a, a lot of the work that Robinson has done since is is kind of in that same mode. Going back to the question about can we recreate it, it can be done probably in HTML5 and CSS. Remember, one of the things we argue in our program is don't use proprietary software mm -hmm. for your final output <laughs> because <laughs> you know Flash is difficult and yeah. this is Director, and so this was made in a I mean Director jumped up to eight, mm -hmm. which was a the seven actually was a total redo of the previous, and then eight was another jump. So you can't read this stuff anymore. So how, you know, if you make it in things that are proprietary, there's no future, it's, there's no guarantee it's going to be supported in the future. So HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript, learn those things, and you know, don't make your stuff. I totally agree. Um, and I say that <coughs> as someone who did the next title in the series, and we did it first in Director, and then when it became clear Director was going to die, we did the, the game in HTML5, CSS3, <laughs> and JavaScript. Mm -hmm. um, but, th but the thing about Director was that it was really built for a static screen, uh, kind of a kiosk display, and what it gave you was perfectly perfect control. So you had, you had the space, you move the images around pixel by pixel, you've got them exactly where you wanted them, and you had this very seamless, beautiful, kind of smooth surface to work with. Um, HTML5 and, and uh, CSS, they're made for movement. Mm -hmm. You know, they're made for, made for um, changing the screen size, and what that means is you, you just can't rely on pixel perfect layout anymore. So you really have to rethink what a design looks like mm -hmm. and so having having a design like like this one i can see how you know all those all, all that material could be moved into like basically a background basic right and then put uh, text overlays over the top but you'd never quite guarantee where everything was going to be um, depending on whether you're on a mobile device or yeah so director was cinematic yes and html5 is not cinematic no so very different we have a question from the audience online. What exactly inspired this project about Mars in particular, as opposed to another planet? Were there any plans to create a series of informational DVDs on the planet? And this is from Troy Scott. Oh, interesting. Um, I don't know for sure whether there were, there, there weren't plans from us to do the, the next one. The next one we were going to work on was actually one about gravity. Um, I, and I think this was because um, Bob was a, a early modern scholar and he was interested in the, um, the scientists of that period. 
Um, the, the answer to, to the Mars question is that Mars is the planet that's most like our planet and um, it's it's the one that we've used to think through our own understandings of ecology and science and our place in the solar system. Um, you know, Venus, you, you kind of get there and melt pretty much. Many of the other planets don't even have surfaces. Um, but Mars is, is something you can all almost imagine surviving on um, if you can stay warm and get oxygen, <laughs> you've got a, you know, a decent tell. chance <laughs> of, of maybe being there. Um, you know, I, I, I loved seeing The Martian when it came to yeah, the big screen great. because it was it was everything I'd imagined. You know, this just kind of a little pod on on Mars and somebody trying to grow potatoes and yes. you know having to having to deal with that thing. It was yeah. So um, Mars, because it's most like us. Yep. Yeah. Other questions. So one of the things I think is interesting to think about is that, you know, she's here, the new media scholar, she works in medieval, or had worked in medieval, still works in medieval. You know, how do you, how do you get this kind of background? What is this called for people in our field? I mean, how do you describe this? And I would say a lot of folks work on, working on this project were part of the Society for Literature, yeah. Science, what? Literature, Science, Society for Science, Literature, and the Arts, or yeah. SALSA. Yeah. So there's this, these little pockets of areas where you can study. So if you're interested in, in, the, in the combination of science, literature, and art, that's the group. So Mark Lee's from that, or he was president yeah. of that organization. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that was uh, when I came to the U.S. as a grad student. That was the fir very first conference I ever went to was um, SALSA, or they called it SLS at the time, so yeah. uh, Society for Literature and Science, um, the Arts. It came a little later, and um, it was in Gainesville, Florida, and you know, I went to this conference, and I felt like a real grown-up, mm -hmm. <laughs> like a real grown-up scholar. Um, but yeah, this this really comes out of um, I think a couple of things. One is uh, Georgia Tech was very big on uh, developing, you know, really working at the cutting edge of multimedia, and mm -hmm. um, Bob had you know connections at Georgia Tech, and the other thing was that there was a, a literature and science community and you know I'd come to the US to study to really to study science fiction I'd written my master's thesis on on science fiction and so I'd, I'd kind of come to to do that yeah. yeah so there's there's a place for all of us you just tell me what you're interested in or well, funny of that direction <laughs> but salsa is really cool yeah salsa is really if cool. you're interested in the combination of this kind of ast you know, astronomical questions mm. and how they work at science fiction literature, that's the area for you to study. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Any other any questions? Anything you guys want to ask? People are at online saying they want to see a VR or MR adaptation of oh, this project. Wow. Would that be amazing? Oh, uh, that would be beautiful. That would be interesting. And, yeah. and then Royner, you said, yes, I'd love to see that. Mm -hmm. You should make that. You're in the class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this could be a senior seminar project. Yeah. Just take this project and turn it into a VR experience. Wouldn't that be cool? You get all the data. Yeah, yeah. A little scary, says Bailey Anderson. <laughs> 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 I can imagine how you could do it too. Um, Jeanette Altman was, uh, uh, our keynote was the person who did these beautiful kinds of um, fine, what look like pencil overlays over a lot of the Mars images. And um, she always had this, this kind of, um, Look, look at transparency, and this is something that Hudson Higgs was working on with a lot too. Was this kind of layering and transparency of images, and you can just see kind of like curtains that have been like transparent with all these kinds of lines on them. It would make a beautiful kind of space to work in VR. I think Jeanette worked here as well. She worked with Harrison in the Fine Arts program, and she was one of the DTC's best friends. I want to go on record saying that, and she was. She was also, um, she designed the logo for the Visionary Landscape Conference mm. for ELO in 2008. Mm, mm. And the DTC's website, when I first came here, we took over this website and um, she did the beautiful design for mm. that. So anyway, so it's, it, I could see her handprint all over yeah. this interface. Yeah. It's just incredible. Yeah. We're bragging about you, Jeanette. <laughs> I miss you guys. <laughs> See, I miss you guys too. She moved to Alaska. 
back about four years ago, I think it was, and um, she was living down where Greg's office is currently. So, yeah. so we took over her space, really miss her. Yeah. yeah. And then of course Harrison's art. I mean, this the design is just incredible, and I think the structure. So who, Helen, who designed the structure of this? The wire framing of this must have been really interesting to work on. Well, it was kind of a collaborative effort, but Harrison really was the, the kind of the motivating um, force behind the the kind of technical infrastructure <coughs> and, and the. Uh, it really does seem like it's it's his aesthetic um, that m makes it look like a book, which I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like a book with lots of layers in it, um, and um, you know it, we. We're in a kind of a weird profession where we're not quite we're not working with industry, but we're working with industry tools. And I, I watched Harrison learn all this stuff. Like he just he taught me everything I know about the director, and he just kind of mastered the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And he was working with um, you know digital tape, so we went like some of the. Um, camera work was done on tape, some was done with the kind of different kinds of digital tape and he was having to work out all the standards for all the technology and it was all changing and um, yeah, props because <laughs> that was a, a, a huge project to take out and, and try and deal with, especially over the course of four years when we went through from director version 5 to version 7, that's two major upgrades that changed um, basic functioning in the software, mm -hmm. um, and multiple quick time upgrades all the way through. We started out working with tape and ended up working with like jazz drives or something, and um, Harrison, I'd, I'd go into his office and there was just like just stuff everywhere, like all the old drives and the equipment and you know, where do you put it all? So just for one project, it's kind of amazing. And the funding of this, I mean, mm. th to think about how this is made and the mo amount of money that something like this would take today, Yeah, I can't even fathom it. And this was done on someone's research fund. Yeah. Someone's profession, I mean, it, that, that, that couldn't happen today. Yeah. yeah. So the scale of these projects today are just so different than they were in the original in the early forms, right? It's so much easier to do these kinds of things, I think, back then. We kind of cobbled it together yeah. from, from funding from um, Washington State and um, from West Virginia University. and. Um, <laughs> One of the things, and, and we've written about this is actually, is um, nobody's getting paid for this, so how do you actually give them credit? Yeah. And, um, <coughs> you know, given that even co-authorship is kind of contentious in English, um, how do you deal with this? Yeah. And we, we spent a long time talking about, well, how do you give this project credit for this kind of work? And we decided on the kind of the film model. So there's a whole section in here that's just credit for um, various people who worked on the project and mm -hmm. it's, um, yeah, and th that's also part of the reason that we tried to keep it kind of scholarly and focused is so that the scholars on the project could actually get credit for this yeah. because um, credit only goes so far on Peter Gobskull's projects. Yeah, Michelle Kendrick, when she went up for tenure, you said she printed this out. She was required to print it print out. this out to the English <laughs> department to show that it was really bookish. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the stuff you have to do to keep your jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Things have changed and gotten a little bit better. They have. They we didn't have. have to print out Pathfinders. That was a good thing. Yeah, yeah. But boy, that was, I mean, 2003, yeah, she had to print that out. Yeah, we had a little giggle about how we were going to print out video. Yeah. So it didn't happen. Yeah, when I went up for tenure in 2001, my tenure files were like huge because I had to print out websites, mm. you know, and then show links to websites. Like, say, here's this website, six links, so here's all the pages that go with those links. It was yeah. insane. So, mm -hmm. yeah. we have time for one more question before we close, because some of you have to go to class. Any other questions you want to ask? Yes, please. Just about Mars. Um, I know the sun is like expanding slowly over millions of years. Yeah. I mean, is this going to lead to the ice caps on Mars melting and more of like, I mean, it's so far away. I mean, do we put the funding towards thinking that part of the future? No. Mm, that's interesting. Well, I mean, you know, it'll it'll hit it'll hit us first. 
I mean, <laughs> yeah, <so we> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, that's so far in the future that yeah, I kind of hope we'll be off planet by then. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, otherwise we're, we're kind of screwed. I mean, Mars is interesting because, you know, they, they didn't really know this until recently. Um, even even the, the, the people on this project were talking about how stuff just blew away. Um, and that turns out to be true. The, the, um, the thing that was holding Mars in the atmosphere and um, has to do with the magnetic field um, that it has. And, you know, if you don't really have a strong magnetic field, stuff doesn't stick around. It just kind of, you know. Yeah, so and, we and gravity is our friend. Yeah, gravity is our friend, uh, and uh, <laughs> our our beautiful iron core that creates our beautiful magnetic field is protecting us. So, well, thank you, Helen, for doing this, for flying in and being here for two days thank and you, a Judy. kind of quick trip here yeah, and back. Yeah, so fun. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I have a record of all of your chat, so I know who's here. It's all your live chats and stuff. So thank you for coming. That was wonderful. Wow.